Hello, team. We hope you've been enjoying our first Young Justice actual play using Masks, a new generation. If you'd like to check out the game for yourself, Magpie Games has generously given us two ways to help you do that. First, you can link over to www.magpiegames.com and use the discount code WHELMED, W-H-E-L-M-E-D, all caps, to get 30% off either the softcover or hardcover copy of the game. The discount is good through September 30th, 2017. Second, you can link over to www.patreon.com slash crashing the mode and back our show at the beta squad level. Beta squad and higher level backers receive a PDF copy of Masks, a new generation for free. With all that out of the way, let's get on with the show. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Superboy, B, 0, 4. Recognized, Miss Martian, B, 0, 5. Initiate, Super Sweethearts. Welcome to the cave, everybody. And welcome also to the first installment of Super Sweethearts, the bonus episode series where heroes hold hands and we all know smoochy moments are important. Here, I'll be talking about teen heroes in love and diving into the romantic arcs of the show and what we can learn as creators about portraying relationships and fiction, because there's quite a bit we can learn from this show on that end. <laughs> as a disclaimer before we start, I want to say that all forms of shipping are subjective. The relationships I love you may hate, and the emotional moments that I think are strong and well executed may come off as forced to you. It's all a matter of opinion. So, like any sort of analysis or writing advice, take everything I say with a grain of salt. There is no one right way to write a love story. I'm just going to be diving into a few and sharing with you some of the subtle little details you might have missed if you weren't as focused on everyone loving each other as I was. <laughs> Today, we'll be talking about my OTP, the adorable aliens who had a bit of a falling out in season two, Super Martian or Connor and McGann for the uninitiated. <laughs> and as a quick spoiler warning before we dive in, I will say that I'll be talking about who ends up with who and how we get there, so be prepared for spoilers on that front. You're strong, and I'm stubborn. Together! Together. So, the first appearance of Super Martian was actually in Young Justice. Super Martian, unlike some of the other ships on the show, is not a couple that has a long-standing comic book history before YJ, but after Season 2 ended, McGann actually appeared in the Smallville Season 11 comic book series that was going on, and she and Connor shared a kiss at one point. So, I like to think that Young Justice may have had a hand in making that an option. <laughs> Anyone who listens to Elmed knows that Super Martian is my Young Justice OTP, so there will probably be some fangirling in here. They're adorable, and I love them, and their dynamic, and just everything. But there's a lot more than just cuteness when it comes to their romantic arc and their shared narrative. So I'll be diving into that, too. <laughs> Starting at the beginning with these two, after Connor and McGann's initial meeting and several episodes of an obvious crush, an oblivious clone, and a whole lot of unresolved sexual tension, McGann and Connor eventually settled into a relationship that TV Tropes classifies as brooding boy, gentle girl. The simple definition of that is that a moody, teen angst-filled male character is brightened up by the love of a kind, sweet, gentle female character. This trope can honestly often be a bit problematic when it's not handled well, because it can perpetuate stereotypes about good girls having to fix their boyfriends and a bunch of other stuff that's not that great. However, with Super Martian, I feel like it actually works pretty well, because both characters are allowed to mature and develop on their own, and neither remains stagnant, and neither one is confined simply to just that stereotypical role in the relationship. Connor remained nothing but a ball of rage sulking in his issues with Superman for the entire first season and McGann did nothing but coddle him, then I'd have an issue with all of that underlying subtext. 
Instead, both characters change as time goes on. Connor is the brooding boy because he does actively have quite legitimate issues to work through, while McGann fulfills the gentle girl role not by placating him, but by showing him that he can be more than the weapon he was designed to be. Her gentleness mellows his anger because it shows him he can actually be a person, while his rougher character traits bring out good things in her as well, because she's not just the gentle girl. She's also incredibly powerful and feisty and fiery enough to match him when he needs to be matched. So it's cool. <laughs> but we'll talk a bit more about all of that later. Speaking of development, it's not just important with individual characters, it's important in relationships too. Don't be afraid of it as a writer. So many shows save the big kiss and the official get-together until literally the series finale, and it happens a lot in cartoons, because so many of those attempt to remain episodic by not allowing their characters to mature as people. Young Justice didn't do that. Timestamps and an overarching metaplot mean that characters have to grow and change and mature, and as a result, so do their relationships. Connor and McGann get together about halfway through season one in my personal favorite episode, Terrors. There had been quite a few hints that they liked each other up to that point, from McGann's adorable but awkward stumbling attempts at flirtation, to Connor's occasional smiles in her direction, and of course the infamous downtime cooking disaster, they'd definitely had their moments. <laughs> All of which culminated in McGann's piecing back together of Connor's mind in Bereft, a truly adorable scene that allows Connor to not only grasp the full depths of her feelings for him, but relive his interactions with her, which allows his feelings to finally dawn on him. And it's precious. <laughs> It also, of course, sets up the narrative thread that Connor knows she's a white Martian from that point on and just doesn't push it because he respects her enough to know that she'll tell him when she's ready. However, they're interrupted in that adorable moment by Sphere before any actual smooching can take place, and as a long-time shipper, after their almost kiss in Bereft, I was convinced the show would just continue having that whole we're clearly crushing on each other but can't take that to the next level because episodic continuity thing. Which is so frustrating. Targets even continued down that path with blushing, telepathic communication on the first day of school, Connor attempting to be protective in the face of cheerleaders, and of course him carrying her books like a high school rom-com hero, but no actual acknowledgement of what had happened last episode. <laughs> but terrors changed all of that. After a harrowing stay in prison undercover in which both Connor and McGann had to think their way out of some very bad situations while also dealing with their own personal struggles, things progress significantly. <laughs> I can say when this episode first premiered, I was genuinely shouting, oh my god, just kiss at my screen. But as all shippers know, screaming kiss her doesn't usually work, especially when you're only halfway through the first season. But YJ was different. There was no fake out, no almost, no interruption this time around. Once McGann is safely out of that block of ice, Connor just kisses her. <laughs> It just happens. And from a character standpoint, this shows that not only has he accepted his feelings towards her, he also understands what those feelings mean as well as what a kiss is and what it means, and shows that he's developing from a weapon into a fully-fledged person with feelings and emotions and love. All of this despite his socially inept Cadmus programming. But from a shipping perspective, this kiss made me the happiest little nerd girl in the world for a few days. <laughs> this is probably the episode I've seen the most, and that kiss is probably the scene I have watched the most. I was very excited that weekend. <laughs> but from a narrative perspective, terrors changes things. From that moment onward, Connor and McGann are in a relationship at least in season one. And that shift in dynamic affects not only their interactions, but the team as a whole. Terrors showed that writers don't have to just stretch the will-they-won't-they they question out until the very last minute. If you resolve it early, then you can explore even more interesting narratives. 
One of those, of course, being the story of working out the issues in a relationship. McGann and Connor don't get together and then ride off into the sunset. They have a relationship. They live, work, and go to school together. And through all of that, they also have to work out what being together means. And one of the main things that they have to work through is that neither of them is perfect. It's addressed in Terrors and later in Alpha Male, but I'll start with that incredible therapy session from Terrors. Rich and I talked a bit more about this in the shipping and fanfic discussion episode I did a while back, but here's the gist of it. That scene with Hugo Strange shows that McGann is aware of Connor's anger and his issues with Superman, while Connor is equally aware of McGann's unwavering optimism and her occasionally skewed perspective of the world as a result of watching too much TV. We also find out later that that scene shows that he knows she's a white Martian and isn't pushing the issue. Neither of them see the other as perfect, and that scene's a perfect illustration of that. This whole thing is even reinforced later by a school junior telling Connor that all you need is someone who sees the psycho that you are and likes you anyway. In both reality and fiction, idealizing your romantic partner is a dangerous thing. It turns people into prizes placed on pedestals, and that's not something you really want. Having your character see their love interest as perfect can be both problematic and really boring. I don't want to watch or read about two perfect people telling each other how perfect they are. Give me two flawed people, have them acknowledge their differences and issues, and allow them to work through things together as a team, and allow them to just love each other even with those issues and with those differences and with those imperfections. And of course, speaking of teams, because they need to work through things as a team. Connor and McGinn's relationship affects their dynamic within the team as well. It comes up in alpha males when the whole team's a bit fractured and Connor attempts to be the strong doting boyfriend after McGann's near death in the previous episode. She calls him out on being overprotective, he gets upset that she won't just let him help her, and they both storm off. But later, they talk and they compromise. She tells him that while his desire to keep her safe is sweet, on a mission, I'm your teammate, not your girlfriend. And he agrees. They act like two relatively mature adults and work things out whenever they have an issue. Development like that and development at all allows for more interesting narrative beats down the line. And speaking of development, I just want to share two little things that I love about McGann and Connor's relationship post-terrors. The first is that the two of them kiss, often. Throughout the first season, they share a total of four kisses, which doesn't seem like much, but it honestly just doesn't happen in kids' fiction. In a lot of shows, especially those aimed at a younger audience, couples only kiss when it's an epic and sweeping romantic gesture, when people are going off on dangerous missions, or when people have almost died, or when the world's coming to an end, or it breaks a curse, or whatever it may be. Kisses are used as capital E events, and while that's a lot of fun as a shipper, in real life, people kiss all the time. People kiss casually. And in Young Justice, so do McGann and Connor. (laughs) The first time we see them after that epic prison kiss in Terrors, and fun fact, that epic prison kiss in Terrors was actually a real kiss between Nolan North and Danica McKellar, Superboy and Miss Martian's voice actors in the sound booth because that's what they had to do to get the audio for that right, and that just amuses me endlessly. (laughs) But the first time we see them after that real kiss, they're just casually making out in the cave, (laughs) completely safe, supposedly fixing the bikes, and just generally having a good time. It's sweet, and is refreshing as a viewer to get a romantic narrative that progresses differently. And as a shipper, it means more kisses, which is always a plus. (laughs) The other thing I wanted to touch on is from Failsafe. Among all of the trauma and heartbreak of that incredible episode, there's one line that always sticks out to me. Just before the remaining team members attack the alien ship, McGann reaches out to Connor telepathically and says, Be careful, Connor. I love you. Whether or not this is the first time she said those words... 
we don't know, but it's the first time we as viewers hear them. And even more interestingly, they're words you don't often hear on things that are technically a kid's show. Shows, and especially cartoons about teenagers that are still aimed at children, so often have characters say that they really like one another. They care about each other. They have feelings for each other. They have a crush on someone. They say a million different ways to water down affection and attraction. <laughs> because love is apparently too intense for the kids watching at home. I guess. <laughs> While all of those phrases are fine, I love that McGann and Connor are allowed to love each other. Young Justice acknowledged that teenagers can and do feel things that go far beyond simple infatuation. So don't be afraid to let your young characters form deep connections and express them. Not everything has to be a fling or a crush. It can be real. And that can be incredibly engaging as a reader or a viewer. And then, after all of this, season two happened. If you've listened to our first season two episode, then you know how I felt about the breakup. But to sum it up, I was kind of devastated. I cried on my couch after the episode premiered. <laughs> yeah, to some, that may seem like an overreaction. Just another little shipper girl being attacked by her feels or whatever. But within the narrative, it's kind of meant to be devastating. So much changes between seasons, including that. It's meant to be a shock, and when we find out the full extent of why Connor broke up with McGann, it goes from being a shock to being a punch in the gut. I have cried watching that Bioship reveal scene because it is just that emotional. And if one character had just said, oh, they're not together anymore, and then everyone just moved on, that narrative would not carry the same emotional weight. Breakups, just like everything else in romantic fiction, have to matter if you want your audience to be invested. While on a hopeless romantic level, I may not have liked the breakup because I just want people to be happy and in love and work out all their problems together and not date sea creatures. As a writer and creator, I am continually floored by Connor and McGann's narrative and dynamic in season two. The breakup itself and the reasoning behind it are impressive all on their own, but the added nuance of both of them being equal parts sad, hurt, angry, lonely, and still in love with each other makes it even better. Some creators would have approached this arc with the mentality that Connor and McGann could only be angry at each other, or could only be mutually pining, thinking that the other didn't want them back. But instead, it's a little bit of both. Earthlings, the second episode of the second season, shows that it's so much more complex than either of those. Connor's mad and he's frustrated, but he's still concerned about McGann's well-being. At the same time, McGann still has feelings for him, but is also annoyed that he doesn't agree with her choices. Their emotions aren't black and white. They're complicated. Pulling off a believable breakup arc in which both characters still clearly have feelings for each other that doesn't drive the viewer to scream, then why aren't you two just dating right now at their screen at every turn can be kind of difficult. But YJ pulls it off masterfully. It matters to the viewers because it matters to the characters. Megan and Connor are still invested in their failed relationship. You can see it in every one of their snippy little comments and longing gazes throughout the second season, which makes us, as the viewer, equally invested. Or at least equally invested if you are a super merchant shipper, I guess. And it makes their eventual semi-reconciliation in the finale that much sweeter. They've both made mistakes, McGann somewhat more than Connor, but there's so much history and emotion there that a simple interrupted conversation can hold a lot of hope. <laughs> there, I wanted to end all of this on a positive note. But before I wrap everything up, I wanted to talk a little bit about why Super Martian personally means so much to me. In the Dick Grayson Secret Origins episode, Rich talked a bit about what Dick Grayson means to him. 
so I thought it was only fair that in the first episode of my series, I talk a little bit about why Super Martian matters to me. I've talked before about how McGann is my favorite character and how I relate to her on some level and want her to be happy and I just like them together. I think they're cute. <laughs> and that's reason enough to like them for me and that's reason enough for them to matter to me. But it goes a little bit beyond that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about them and me <laughs> and why it matters. Because while Super Martian might not be my first OTP, because that goes all the way back to Disney movies and Saturday morning shows and cartoons of like Winx Club and Code Lyoko and those things that I was watching when I was really little. And it's not my first intro to shipping. Super Martian was not my first intro to shipping and fandom. Uh, that spot is reserved for Avatar The Last Airbender and the great Zutara versus Katang ship wars of the mid-2000s that I discovered in the week leading up to the Sozin's Comet show. But Super Martian and Young Justice was my first real engagement in online fandom. As I said, Terrors was my favorite episode. Still is my favorite episode. It doesn't matter if it's not the best written one. It doesn't matter. Terrors is my favorite because it's when my ship gets together. But after Terrors premiered and I was so incredibly excited because my ship was together. They kissed. It was real. It happened. Yay. Um, I was little 13 year old me was going through YouTube and searching through YouTube trying to find that clip. I was looking for Super Martian AMVs and clips from this episode, and that led me to stumble across some YouTube reviewers who reviewed the episode and talked about what they liked and what they didn't like. And I'm not going to mention names because basically all of them have moved on to other very different projects, and I don't want people like looking for these because they're very separate from what any of these online creators are doing now. But seeing those YouTube reviews and seeing those creators online talking and analyzing this show led to that little journal entry review that we talked about in my discussion episode back in the day. And doing that and writing about shows and analyzing shows is what eventually led me to engage more with the online fandom and led me to engage with the YJ files on Twitter and led to this. <laughs> led to me sitting here talking into a mic and telling a bunch of people on the internet why I love Super Martian. I wouldn't be here without that. <laughs> without loving them so much that I wanted to write about them and wanted to eventually start writing about them online because Super Martian was one of the first fan fictions that I put online. It was not the first, because I will talk about what ship that was when we get to them in a different episode, but it was one of the first that I wrote and that I eventually uploaded onto my page back in the day. And without terrors and without Super Martian, I'm not sure I would have engaged that much with the online fandom. I was following things online, I was lurking in forums and all of that and paying attention to what people were saying, but I wasn't adding to the conversation for a while with this show, even though I loved it and even though I loved Super Martian. But Super Martian and Super Martian getting together was what pushed me to enter the online fandom and contribute to the online fandom in whatever little ways I could. And if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't taken that step and cared so much about these two being happy together and been so in love with their love story, I wouldn't have this opportunity right now. <laughs> so that's why they mean so much to me just to wrap this up and not have it be too overly dramatic and emotional. 
back in the day in my little middle school, seventh grade, eighth grade notebook. I had a tiny little piece of Super Martian fan art that I loved. That's still one of my favorite pieces of Super Martian fan art printed out and glued into the front cover of my notebook because I loved them that much. They were that much my favorites that I had them with me every day at school because I loved them. I loved their dynamic. I still love their dynamic. And I love their love story. And I love how much they care about each other and how much they respect each other and how much they're allowed to be happy, at least in the first season. And maybe in the future. We'll see. Who knows? But that is the super condensed version of why Super Martian means a lot to me. Because while I do ship other things on this show, they'll always hold a very special place in my heart for that reason and so many others. Now, <laughs> let's wrap this up, as I hope you don't mind that little personal tangent of mine. But let's wrap this up. Just going to let you know, as always, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, www.crashingthemode.com, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com, and at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. So many ways to get in touch with us. And don't forget to hashtag keep binging YJ and hashtag buy YJ comics on Comixology. There are actually some really cute Super Martian moments in the comics if you want to go check them out. Some little things of them in Bialia and them in Atlantis and just a few other little adventures. And don't forget to tune in soon for the next episode of The Young Justice Files. And remember, stay whelmed, everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.